Notice of motion, Councillor Dollywell, in regard to coal export. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, I would recall uh, that in December, uh, uh, I served this notice that a motion would be brought forward that will deal with the expansion, proposed expansion, particularly as Fraser, at Fraser Surrey Docks and the Neptune Terminal Facilities, Your Worship. That uh, motion is uh, in front of the Council. I would like to read that motion. <coughs> Uh, so it is uh, for the purposes of, of our citizens and the viewers. It's, it's a cold exports motion. Whereas Port Metro Vancouver is in the process of making a decision to significantly increase coal exports, expanding the Fraser Surrey Dock and Neptune Terminal facilities, and whereas the Environment Impact Assessment report produced by SNC Lavalin is deemed unsatisfactory by the Chief Medical Health Officers of the Fraser Health Authority and Vancouver Coastal Health, therefore be it resolved that the City of Burnaby strongly oppose any expansion of coal shipment facilities at the Fraser City Docks and Neptune Terminals until a a more comprehensive and transparent assessment of coal dust impact on human health is completed by an independent uh, by independent experts and Port Metro Vancouver holds formal public hearings on the opposed expansion of coal exports from the Surrey Fraser Docks and Neptune Terminal. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, there has been a fair amount of publicity over the last uh, year, I would say. And you will recall from uh, yourself, Your Worship, you participated in debate at Metro Vancouver. Metro Vancouver Board dealt with the, uh, the initial pr the proposal when it came from uh, both Metro Vancouver, allow or ask, uh, allowing or, or, or considering uh, Fraser Surrey Docks facility to start shipping coal from that facility. They don't do it now. And that report at time, Your Worship, you will recall raised some questions about that expansion. And Metro Vancouver uh, had said that we need some more information and, and, and fair, amount, fair amount of uh, pressure from the community built up on that. And I believe based on that, Port Metro Vancouver then asked Fraser Surrey Docks to, to have environmental impact assessment. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, Your Worship, first of all, asking uh, Fraser Surrey Dock uh, facility, uh, Fraser Surrey Dock facility, to come back with the with the uh, environmental impact assessment. I think it should be the responsibility, which was a responsibility the one time for provincial ministry of the environment to do certain studies, to leave it to the, the proponent of the project. It does not make a whole lot of sense. Nonetheless, they did produce that report, and that was released in October, Your Worship. And that report was very closely studied by our health office of uh, our chief and uh, medical health officers of both the Fraser Health and Coastal um, uh, Coastal Health Authority. Your Worship, they concluded that that report was lacking uh, uh, credibility in many ways. One that the data used in that report was previously previously from other reports produced by other consultants. It was basically cut and paste type of report that came forward. It did not assess thoroughly what the impact on the local health, local season would be of shipping that coal from, from Fraser Surrey Docks. And that, that letter was sent to the port um, and your worship, we received a copy of that letter in December. Based on that, your worship, I um, asked for this, um, uh, asked council's permission to bring this motion forward. It's very clear, Your Worship, that uh, the coal that is being proposed to ship from, um, from Fraser Surrey Docks is not coal coming from BC. It's most of that coal is going to come from the United States. That, at least that's what the report said. And the coal is coming to BC because Washington, state of Washington and Oregon have basically said, no, we are not going to consider shipping from our ports. That's what the report said. And uh, the reason that has suddenly become a priority for the United States, Your Worship, the United States is, is really not happy with using that quality of coal in their plants, energy producing plants. They have wanted to move away from the thermal coal. Most likely is now because it's available, so, so the producers want to ship that coal to Asia. 
since there's no ports in the United States, they want to ship that from British Columbia. Your Worship, this brings no economic benefit, no meaningful economic benefits to the local communities, but they would be in our backyard here shipping that coal over, over trains, because these would be basically shipped the trains to Fraser Surrey docks and then barged from there to Texada Island and then shipped to overseas. That would create minimal number of jobs in D.C., but it brings a whole lot of health effects to us. And we must rely on the advice and, and the findings of the doctors and these two have the medical health officers who have said that this information is not adequate. What the motion is seeking, Your Worship, which, uh, which is not saying that we should not ever continue with shipping coal. This is not asking for a ban on the shipment of current existing facility. It's saying the expansion of this should not be considered until, first of all, we have a proper assessment of coal dust on human health as well as the environment uh, by an independent third party who can actually give the public what the long-term effects are. And the second part is that the public was never consulted. We need to have a say in when the port facility is expanded, uh, that what is that, what, how would that affect our quality of life and our city issue worship. On both these accounts, if you look very carefully, we, uh, we know uh, beyond coal dust, there are other problems with shipping this kind of material to trains. I'm going to leave that. I'm not going to mix the two things together. We know what has happened right in Burnaby over the weekend uh, from, and, and the potential danger of shipping combustible material or, or toxic material, toxins material through rail shipment. Uh, but just keeping with the, the motion, Your Worship, uh, until we know that that uh, the, the there is the safety of the of, of our citizens is is uh, taken care of. Uh, we do not need to sacrifice everything just for for a, a few dollars more for a certain company while it doesn't have a, a very major benefit to the community. Based on that, Your Worship, I'm going to to ask my colleagues to support this motion. Uh, it is inconsistent with pa in the past what this city has, this council has done, that we do not want to continue proceeding with some of these uh, uh, projects until we know what the effects on the local um, uh, citizen is. So I, I ask uh, uh, the council to, uh, to support this motion, Your Worship. I, um, I just want to add to what you said by indicating that more and more I'm beginning to feel like British Columbia is becoming a banana republic. Uh, over and over again we see decisions being made by bodies who are not independent. Port Metro Vancouver is conducting this environmental assessment. The majority of directors on Port Metro Vancouver are appointed by the very companies that stand to economically benefit from these decisions. And so here you've got a board of directors appointed by the companies that is in charge of the environmental assessment to determine whether they're going to make more money. So they go out and hire SNC-Lavalin to do the report for them. Now SNC-Lavalin has done more to bring Canadian engineering into disrepute than any company has ever had the misfortune to do in the history of Canada. This is one of the few Canadian companies who could attain the high goal of being banned for 10 years by the World Bank for corruption. This is a company that is up to its earlobes in corruption in Montreal right now in the investigation. And yet here in BC, they're the independent organization brought in to do environmental assessments for the very board appointed by the companies who benefit from the environmental assessment. This is crazy. You know, this is completely losing control of any public interest in these kind of projects whatsoever. So here we are with the Fraser Surrey docks being util utilized to bring in American coal that's been refused in American ports to be shipped overseas. Meanwhile, meanwhile they refuse to short sea ship any of the containers of goods that are arriving in our port each day so that they could be easily moved to distribution centers in Surrey and Langley. 
So instead of moving goods down the Fraser River so that we can distribute them more efficiently, not taking that traffic through our cities, instead we're bringing dirty coal in, shipping it by barge to Texada Island and then shipping it to China as if we're not all sharing the same air shed and that that dirty coal isn't going to blow right back into our atmosphere. It's, uh, it's insanity. And, uh, and then they wonder why politicians have such difficulty in trusting the machinations of our senior orders of government, the ones that are given all the constitutional authority to be able to impose their will on local municipalities. It's incredibly frustrating. Those of you out there who read a little bit about SNC-Lavalin and their reputation would not be saying to us what a great idea it is that they're given the task of doing an environmental assessment to protect the interests of citizens in our country. They certainly haven't been protecting the interests of people all over the world or the World Bank wouldn't have banned them from utilizing any World Bank funds. So. It's difficult and uh, it's hard for people to keep up with the, the way these multinational corporations are acting, their reputations, their performance, and uh, we can only depend on the press. We can only depend on the press to call it as it is and to make clear that if this company's been banned by the World Bank, why the heck are they doing environmental assessments in our backyard? Councillor Balco. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, um happy to support the uh, the motion I think it's timely and I too don't want to uh, mix the events over the weekend uh, with this motion but I find it uh, I find it uh, passing strange that uh, councillor Dallywell brought for this no notice of motion he must have seen something because uh, the timing couldn't be better but I just wanted to and you were mentioning the uh, the press I, I was uh, doing a little research in regards to this topic and I wanted to see uh, what the process is in the United States, in particular in the states of uh, Washington and Oregon, which had an opportunity long before Port Metro Vancouver decided to take on this project. They had an opportunity to be able to export 48 million tons of powder basin coal from the state of Montana. And they were given the same lines that we're being fed here. The uh, great economic boom that would follow, uh, the great job creation uh, that would occur. And I just wanted to read uh, from and I, I haven't seen any of this reported locally in, in any of our major press. And this is from a little paper called the Whatcom County Online. It's a blog out of Whatcom County. I just want to read one paragraph, and, and it shows the difference in the process in Washington State and Oregon and what's been going on here. And this, I'll be very brief on this. The, uh, the two governors, the governor of uh, Washington State, Jay Inslee, and the governor of Oregon, John Kitzhaber, sent a letter jointly, this is in March of last year, sent a letter jointly to the President's Council on Environmental Quality, calling on the federal government to examine the consequences of global air quality and climate impacts of the Pacific Northwest were to start exporting millions of tons of coal to Asia. These are two governors sending a letter to the President of the United States to their Environmental Assessment Board asking specific questions. We haven't heard a peep out of our senior uh, government in this province in regards to this project. We've heard all kinds of people cheerleading and coming forward with absolutely no information other than from that reputable firm SNC-Lavalin and they're banking their support on this project on that report. And I just wanted to uh, one more thing that uh, Governor Inslee of Washington State did and I think this is in, in a complete opposite of what we've done in this province. I believe this province has basically abdicated any environmental reviews in regards to any of these either coal or oil exporting that's going on here. I think they've just ab abdicated the role to the federal government. But here's what the governor of uh, Washington State did. And then in the past summer he gave his support to the Washington State Department of Ecology's decision to use the full extent of its authority demanding the broadest environmental review possible, and this is for a project called Gateway Pacific Terminals at Cherry Point. And Cherry Point, as we all know, is uh, the refinery uh, down there. They had an election in Whatcom County two months ago, and the four people that were in direct opposition of that project, known as the GPT, were all elected. And this was in the face of huge, huge monies rolling in from all over the United States from coal companies supporting 
the opposite slate, which was in full support of the GPT. So they, they're on to something in Washington State and the state of Oregon, and somehow we're quite happy to be left in the dark. None of this gets reported by our local press up here. The business sections that I read here, and I read a lot of them, I haven't heard a negative comment made in regards to this. And I'll close with this because I only learned of this. I thought when, when the, and I'll just refer briefly to the, uh, the events over the weekend, one of the reports uh, in today's paper, and I had no knowledge of this, and uh, the environmental, uh, Dr. Otto Langer, who's a retired biologist from the uh, uh, Department of Fisheries, very re well respected, and the only reason he's speaking out, because he's retired. Those that are still working can't speak out because they'll get fired. I mean, that's the message that's been sent by the federal government. But he said today, and I personally, not being an expert, thought, well, it's, you know, it's a little benign. It's coal going into a creek. What's the problem? And as uh, I was reminded uh, by Dr. Langer, well, the coal is not so much, it's not so much the coal itself that's the problem. It's the fact that it's the fine shards of coal that are now floating into Bern uh, Burnaby Lake. And it gets into the gills of the fish, cuts up the fish, uh, the gills, it uh, prevents them from breathing. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, we just spent the city of Burnaby and the province of British Columbia just expended 22 million bucks to drain and clean that lake. And we just had a railroad come along and dump six carloads of coal into that lake. Now, who's going to be cleaning that up? So, Your Worship, I'm happy to support this. I would urge the citizens of, uh, of Burnaby in particular to really uh, start paying attention to this issue. And I would really hope that the press in this province would start doing their job and feeding us the information that we need to make an informed decision. So I thank Councillor Dalliwell. I'm more than happy to support this uh, motion. Councillor Johnson. You know, Your Worship, it wasn't that long ago that we had beehive burners along the Fraser River that were that were uh, putting fine particulate in, into the air, and we were able to get rid of them after a, a concerted effort. Now we're, we're, we're looking at bringing coal on an on a open car basis along a railroad and, and allowing people to, instead of breathing particulate from a, from a sawmill, much worse uh, coal dust, as was stated by Councillor Volko. Your Worship, I am... Um, I'm, I'm going to wander a little bit on this one. I, I, I've been really paying attention to this railway issue uh, in relation to the coal and the, uh, the recent spill. It wasn't that long ago, um, I believe it was uh, uh, Prime Minister Moroni, when we started a, uh, uh, an era of deregulation in Canada. And as such, what we have now is a situation where, for the most part, business Federal government regulated business is self-regulating itself. We have companies such as CNCP, the uh, Montreal uh, uh, Railroad that was involved in Lake Megantic, uh, self-regulating, self-enforcing, setting the rules, ignoring the rules, and um, as such, we end up with situations um, such as this or the the fire in Lake Megantic. Uh, normally, one would conclusion that a that a that a safe be able to jump to a conclusion that because we have a safety record that, that the public is safe. And yet we're looking, at, we're looking at another situation of a pipeline that's about to uh, be built in, in, again through Burnaby. Uh, we're talking about rail safety, which is safer, putting, putting uh, uh, dangerous substances such as coal or uh, bituin in a, in a railway that's considered not safe for situations such as we had this weekend. Uh, and then we have a, a, a pipeline, but their record's not that much better. Their, their safety record is, is abysmal if you look at the uh, pipelines in Canada. Um, media reports claim that a beaver is responsible for the derailment and coal spill into Silver Creek and Burnaby Lake. Well, I guess investigations over the next few days will determine whether it was the work of a beaver or a beaver pile. Uh, either way, I think the transportation safety is tr sadly lacking, and the citizens of Burnaby and Canada deserve better. Uh, coal transport, uh, oil transport, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, it should be safe. The public should know that it's going through the community. Uh, it should be in such a way that, that the, our fisheries, our lakes, our waters, our, our citizenry are not at, at, at risk. I um, strongly support the recommendation, uh, the report that's before, sorry, the recommendation and a motion that's before us on coal export, and I, I do hope that uh, the federal government actually pays attention to it. Councillor Calendino. 
Thank you, Your Worship. I support the recommendation too, and I'm not sure that the federal government will pay any attention to that, but I hope that uh, uh, they are listening, or at least maybe they will read some of the negative media reports that are coming out regarding rail safety. Uh, the issue here, Your Worship, is uh, the export of coal, and I'll go into rail safety later on. I, I think we received a, a report from the uh, Fraser Health Medical Officer a few months ago expressing serious concerns about the health effects of the uh, uh, coal dust that would uh, emanate from the coal export that's being proposed on the Fraser Delta, uh, the uh, Surrey Delta Fraser docks. And uh, the, uh, I believe that the medical doctor was asking uh, Port uh, Metro Vancouver to do a proper health assessment on the facility, which they haven't done. Uh, or, as you said, they'd give it to uh, Lavalin to do that, and of course they have a self-interest, so they wouldn't really bring up an, ob an objective report. And I think that Port Metro Vancouver should be doing that before they make any decision on the uh, establishment of a free support or the expansion of the uh, uh, Neptune Terminal in North Vancouver, Your Worship, because we live in the air shed and we live around the port and we all breathe any toxic uh, uh, coal dust that uh, uh, arises from such uh, enterprises from the export of coal. And you know, the excuse is, well, we've been exporting coal for the last hundred years and nothing has happened. Yeah. Well, the amount is what makes the difference and the type of coal is what makes the difference. Um, I think we have uh, some report here that uh, indicates all the toxic chemicals that are associated with the handling of coal. But going to the uh, safety of the railway, which affects us because of what happened on, on the weekend in Burnaby, it seems to me that uh, senior governments, uh, in order to look good to their taxpayers, your worship, are actually abdicating their responsibilities. They're deregulating left to right all sort of major industry what, that, that affects people livelihood every day. Uh, they started with the uh, uh, Reagan administration in the, in the U.S. and it's obviously it's moved north to our uh, Ottawa administrators and politicians to deregulate all the major industry, which includes the airline industry, which includes obviously the railway, railway industry. And the result uh, since those uh, uh, days of the Reagan administration has been that uh, maintenance has gone by the wayside and, and on the railway. Uh, I recall seeing uh, maintenance uh, crews on the railway in Burnaby almost every second day, Your Worship, and now I'd be lucky if you see one a month going with their equipment back and forth on, on the rail. And, you know, I cross the railway on uh, Steel Creek on a daily basis, and I, I remember that. Uh, the uh, rail crews going back and forth and trying to repair or at least assessing whether there were any problems there. And as I say, they're rare when you see them now. I think uh, Councillor uh, Volko mentioned that in the last uh, 15 years they've laid off something like 15,000 railway workers. That has to make an impact on the safety of the railroads across the nation. You know, if we look around the world, Your Worship, uh, most national governments are investing in railway infrastructure because that is an economic advantage for that nation, for the transport of goods, obviously. In Canada, on the other hand, instead of investing in railway, the federal government has sold out their interest in the, in the railways to the private sector. And we have CN and NCP, which used to be, uh, CN used to be national, CP was private but now they're all in corporate hands of American companies. But what people perhaps don't know is that the rail cars they use are really not owned by them. They are leased from other companies. So if they have to bring in upgraded rail cars to transport dangerous goods or even petroleum goods which are explosive, they don't have proper cars to, to, to use to transport those goods. Uh, I was listening today on CBC that there are something like 250,000 rail cars that transport dangerous good, good goods in northern BC, including explosive products, and the majority of them would not pass the test today. Yet these leasing companies that own them are not prepared to replace or upgrade them. 
and therefore the railways like uh, CN and CP are stuck with using the existing rails to transport the dangerous goods and then we end up with situations like, like, like Meg Antique and we were fortunate in Burnaby that they weren't carrying petroleum products or explosive products. Uh, they were only carrying petrol, uh, uh, coal and we didn't have uh, a major disaster uh, like it happened in Lake Megandic. But, you know, if the government don't take seriously the importance of uh, uh, transport of dangerous goods like petroleum products and that they actually implement some tough regulations on the railroad industry, well, we're bound to have disasters. And we've seen in the last few months more than one. Thank you. Thank you. And the, um, the reality is that uh, in Ottawa, I think they've forgotten how to spell BC. They have no idea of the impact of these industries in our communities. Uh, but they do have lobbyists that are paid a lot of money by the CPs and CNs and the SNC Lavalins who are working full time back there to get what they want. And whether it has an adverse impact on local uh, communities or on local economies is the last thing in their consideration. And the reality is that as you agree to have things happen in your community, for instance, in our community, at one time there were five refineries. We agreed to a pipeline to service those refineries in this community. Those refineries are closed. What was promised, that these refineries would generate work, that it would be for oil that was being refined in our own community, it's all gone. One refinery left now in our community. And the pipeline now, expand it because we want to export that oil to China. We want that to go overseas. So what was promised and the reason we accepted it becomes none of the reason that there's going to be an expansion of it. And that's the reality over and over again. And what they promise you as far as protection and regulation and safety gradually erodes. Over the next years, they begin to reduce the number of employees. They seek to deregulate the industry. They change the processes. So you end up in a situation where all the promises you were given that would protect your interest are gradually taken away. And some generation pays dearly for a decision that was made in the past. And uh, that's why there needs to be a firm no on these kind of projects, where we need to say that our environment and our future economy is much more important than cheap gain now, than trying to get a few bucks as a result of making a move like the importation of thermal coal and the export of that to China for the simple middleman fee that is garnered by the port here in, in Metro Vancouver. It's, uh, it's a terrible process. And uh, this weekend, we had an example that no matter what they tell you, accidents will happen. And it could have been much worse. And what made me lose sleep over the weekend was the fact that we're never told what kind of substances are coming through our community. As much as we battled to try to get information, they tell us now that uh, they'll give us notification after the fact but they won't tell us what's coming through our community. What makes me stay awake is worrying about those RCMP officers that are going to be the first on the scene and those firefighters who are going to be the first on the scene dealing with the substance they know nothing about but having to be there to protect the public interest. And that could have happened this weekend in the derailment. It could happen next weekend in a derailment. It could be in anybody's community. And we are lucky here in the sense that we have pretty good resources to support our community. We've got pretty good emergency personnel. But in smaller communities all over British Columbia, it's even worse. There are no systems in place to protect those communities. So everyone is a lachmagantic waiting to happen. And uh, I think that, uh, that we, need, we need better from our, our senior governments. We need better from the feds and the province in looking after the interests of local citizens. And if we have to stand up and be counted, then I guess we do. It's not the issue that I wanted to focus on. I'd much rather focus on our own problems, dealing with graffiti in our community and ensuring that our development moves forward. But these issues are important enough that all of us have to stand together to try to dissuade the government from simply looking to cheap economic gain, to cheap 
profit for multinational corporations and look at the broader economic and environmental interests of the people of our province, and that's not happening. So I'm glad the Council is stepping forward on this motion. And uh, if we want to avoid potential disasters in the future, it's only going to be done because we are vigilant in the present and we need to keep working on this issue. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, it carries unanimously. Is there any new business? Councillor Dollywell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I do want to take a moment, so I know we touched on what happened on the weekend. Uh, uh, the reason I want to just bring this up again, Your Worship, I, as you know, I live only about, I don't know, 200 meters from the, from the site uh, where this um, uh, derailment happened. And it has been on my mind, and I think it's on the mind of Burnbyites, all of them, to see what happened uh, over the weekend. And, and perhaps the staff has, uh, has some update on that, what we know so far. It would be beneficial because I think they, although they've been reading and all that, maybe an update for all of us, see what has transpired so far. Your Worship, uh, as you stated, it could have been much worse. Uh, we, this, this derailment was next to the, uh, the business uh, section that we have on the south, uh, there's a fire hall just uh, meters away. Costco is there, and we have a residence probably 50 meters away, a home. And, and, and we know if this was a hazardous material of some kind, which is combustible and leak and, and anything could have happened, this would have been disaster. So it isn't away from people's mind. I know we talked about it. I, I know we talked in the past, I know Councilor Balco has been really, really bringing this to the forefront about what's happening to rail safety and rail transportation system, uh, not just here but across Canada. I think uh, maybe a quick update from the staff to see what transpired and what we have done in a way to, to, to warn the senior governments. I know you have to F through FCM, you've written to FCM in the past that we have no jurisdiction, as you stated, our emergency responders have no idea for, as far as the planning for disaster recovery, because we don't know what the materials are going through. They don't talk to us in timely manner so we can plan to be there, as you said, that people are safe who can respond. And we have no access to information. List, at least we should have the local governments who are gonna respond have instant access in this day and age that which is missing, that, that soon, as soon as that, that incident happened, our fire department should have been able to know what's in that car instantly, because that information is available somewhere. But what good is to us three months from now, oh, by the way, was, that was a coal train that, that happened to be going by when that happened. It isn't good enough. I know we have done in the past, Your Worship, you have written, this council has written, Council Balco has spoken very vociferously. But maybe, maybe just once more, on behalf of the citizens, uh, in light of what has happened, that we press uh, upon our, our MPs and, and our officials, uh, our representatives in Ottawa, and whoever we can talk to to say that the current safety rules just aren't good enough. And, and this is an urban center we are going through uh, with a population center right close to Brentwood, right close to all the area and anything. If it could happen there, it could happen anywhere else. And it did happen. And, and I just don't think it's good enough explanation, Your Worship, to say because a, a beaver lodge or beaver dam was in the vicinity and, and it, it had water accumulated and suddenly erosion happened. This, this is a railroad. I mean, if the infrastructure isn't as secure, as Councilor Walker said, something is lacking. Whether it's the, in, it's the maintenance, whether it's the attention being paid, we don't care. We want it to be safe. We want this travel, uh, rail, rail travel, rail safety, to be uh, a paramount concern to this government. I know you said they don't care, but we want them to know once again how our community was put at risk. The rail goes through that one. Uh, the mountaineer goes through those tracks. It could have been very well one of those trains yes, on Saturday. It just happened to be a train which didn't have a life attached to it. There could have been people on that train. 
and, and it is a very serious matter. So it is on my mind. I know it's on your mind. You said you've, uh, you, you've been worried about this one, but I think people of Burnaby are even more concerned because we know and people other communities are concerned. So I would really like to, one, from the staff, there's a minute or two of update on this one and two, and, and your worship, see if, you, if it's possible to once again reaffirm our commitment to the safety of the community, safety of the railroad system in Canada in general. If there's anything we can do as a commission, I think, uh, for the, just, just to, to recognize this event, we should do so. Well, I'll get staff to give a brief update, but I think probably we should get staff to report back to us because we can get a, uh, a motion out of that report that may provide more emphasis to the, uh, to the federal and provincial government on this issue. I, um, I'm, I'm really taken aback that, uh, that the railway could be surprised by the fact that there might be beavers somewhere close to the railway tracks, um, given that we do have them on our nickels that it, it shouldn't be a big surprise that there might be beavers somewhere near their railway tracks as they go across British Columbia. Um, I don't know, it's hard to miss, miss a national symbol, but they, uh, they apparently were taken by surprise that there might be a beaver there. I'm not sure that's the explanation yet though, so I'd, I'd wait before we start expounding on what the possible causes were. I'd like to hear a little more information because I remain suspicious when the assessment comes out very quickly from the people who are responsible. Um, Mr. Moncur, Mr. Gauss, would you like to give a brief uh, overview of what's happened? Sure, you, you worship, just a, a, a brief overview of where we're at today. So the coal has all been picked up that had spilt. The, the train has been removed in two sections that, that didn't tip over. So the carts that did tip over have also been removed. So the only remaining issue at the moment is the coal that went into the creek, which is estimated to be about one third of a load. Uh, and Triton is working with CN, so that's the consultant that they have hired, that has to come up with an environmental plan to, to go and reclaim that coal from the creek bed. Now from the coal that's still there, from what we can see, it's fairly, fairly large pieces that are of course still in the creek bottom. What's happened to the finer material, it's obviously gone downstream, and that's going to be a little bit harder, no doubt, to get hold of. So we are waiting for Triton to report back, and I'm presuming, including in that report, we will see something about the, the cause, most likely, of it. But environmental work, uh, we expect to be, to be known pretty soon. Other than that, the, the area has been rehabilitated from a, the bank stability perspective, and the trains have been removed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that update, Your Worship. Then would it be appropriate then to ask the staff to bring back a report of the incident? To what, what transpired? Why don't you make that motion and uh, if I can get a seconder for it? Second right, we'll ask staff to report back and, uh, and Mr. Moncur, you might include in that report any suggested motions or any letters that might be written in order to, uh, to advise other orders of government or other organizations about what we think might avoid this in the future. Sure. Thank you. All right. I so move. All right. Any other discussion on that? Are you, yes, Councillor yeah. Calendino? That in the motion, if possible, Your Worship, is that uh, staff monitor the investigation that they're doing because, frankly, I don't trust CN doing the investigation of the cause of the spill and the damage to the creek. And I would rather have some of our staff uh, ensure that a proper uh, investigating is done. Well, it is the Transportation Safety Board that is doing the investigation, and they are an independent organization with the Ministry of Transportation. Um, but I think it would be still very healthy for our staff to take a, a close look at what goes on during the course of the investigation. Okay. All right. You ready for the question? All those in. Oh, sorry. Is there someone else wanting to speak? Oh, ready? I was just going to say I, I support that. Um, one thing that was pointed out to me just a couple minutes ago is that that actually is the Amtrak line. That could have been an Amtrak train, not just a coal train. So I think it's more important. It, it's extremely important that that the investigation is properly done. All right. Uh, ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Councillor Dollywell. Councillor Valco. Yeah, 